Let's discuss a relevant topic in today's world, climate change. To review, the greenhouse effect involves the trapping of radiation by the action of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and water. These gases allow sunlight to penetrate to the surface of the earth, but keep a certain amount of that radiation trapped near the surface of the earth effectively warming the surface temperature. A little bit of this greenhouse effect is important to sustain life on the planet Earth. However, it is a delicate balance. If too much greenhouse gas exists in the atmosphere, it can lead to a runaway effect, meaning like ironically enough, what we might think of as a snowball effect or a domino effect of warmer and warmer temperatures and more and more heat being trapped near the surface of the earth. For most of the history of earth, this delicate balance has stayed right where it needs to be to sustain life. Of course, there have been periods of time that were inhospitable to many life forms in the earth's history. But for the most part, things have been fairly stable for a very long time. This we know by looking at deep core drillings and being able to infer the temperature based on samples from millions of years ago. How does this relate to our modern times? Well, if we throw this balance off by contributing to greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, we could contribute to more and more of a greenhouse effect. This is known as global warming. There is strong evidence that global warming is taking place. Most everyone is aware that the climate is changing. However, some people, particularly in the general public, would like to think that we as humans are not contributing to that climate change. I showed you this bar graph in a previous lecture, but let's discuss it in more detail. The figure you see here represents the answer to a question which was, do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing mean global temperatures? By mean, that means average. If you look at the different shades of blue that appear in the bar graph, you see that Climatologists, particularly those who publish um, frequently, are in near unanimous agreement that humans are indeed contributing to the warming of global temperatures. Even scientists who are not climatologists those are indicated by the darkest shade aside from the general public, where it says non-publishers, non-climatologists. Still, the vast majority of scientists, even if they have no expertise in climatology specifically, they are able to access scientific journal articles and understand the science behind it and are in overwhelming majority of them in agreement that humans are indeed contributing to global warming. The only category which stands out in this bar graph is the general public, particularly if you look at the answer no. Less than 10% of most scientists 
no matter what their field or how active they are in publishing, believe that humans are not contributing at all to global warming. It is only amongst the general public that you see a significant number of people questioning whether humans are contributing to global warming. This is important not because the general public is less able to understand these issues, but because you often hear a lot of talk that there is a debate amongst scientists as to whether humans are indeed contributing to global warming. But this graph reveals that there is no debate amongst scientists, or very little debate, that is. The only significant debate is amongst the general public. Scientists are overwhelmingly in agreement that this is the, the reality we are facing, human activity contributing to global warming. The average person might protest and say, well, I don't see how this can be possible. We just had a blizzard or a record low temperature. Therefore, global warming can't really be happening. If it was, we wouldn't have all of the snow or we wouldn't have this cold snap. The flaw in this logic is a confusion between the terms weather and climate. When we talk about global warming, we are not talking about weather on a day-to-day -day basis. We're talking about climate, first and foremost. So the definitions you see here are given by NASA. The difference between weather and climate is that weather consists of short-term changes, meaning minutes to months long, in the atmosphere. Going on, the quote then says that in most places, weather can change from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, and season to season. However, climate is the average of weather over time and space. Both of these points are important, time and space. When we talk about global warming, we are not talking about what's happening in western Pennsylvania on a particular date or a particular month or even a particular season. Instead, we are talking about vast spaces and vast times and averaging over those two things. What do we mean by this specifically? Well, first we mean long-term averages. So even if we have a certain time where the temperature decreases, there could be an overall increase in temperature for the year. Here's an example that you see below. Look carefully at the temperatures here. To calculate an average annual temperature for this particular region, you would add up the average temperatures for each month, and then divide by 12, the number of months in the year. Go ahead and take a minute to do this and calculate the average temperature for the year in both 1980 and 2011. Again, these are just examples. Have you gotten an answer? Let's examine this. In 1980, your answer should have been that the average temperature for the year would be 53.75 degrees Fahrenheit. Doing the same thing for 2011, you should have found an answer of 55.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is two degrees warmer than the 1980 average temperature. This increase in temperature by itself is not particularly interesting, but what might lead to confusion is if you look at the particular months and the average temperature during those particular months. For example, look at January. 
Somebody living in 2011 who is skeptical of climate change may say, well, it was only 30 degrees for our average temperature in January, and, and in 1980 it was 35 degrees, much, much warmer. Clearly, global warming isn't taking place. Or, have a look then at July, and you see that maybe this difference is made up for later on in, this, in the year. The 73 degree average temperature in 1980 is much smaller than the 80 degree average temperature in 2011. <clears throat> but any of these individual months by themselves do not tell you too much information until you look at the average over the year. Then maybe you're starting to get at something. If you look within a month, you may be equally confused. For example, look at January 2011 and look in particular at the second full week going into the third full week of January. In other words, from January 7th through about January 17th. The temperatures are extremely frigid during this time. Perhaps a blizzard came through. Comparing those to the same two weeks in 1980, you see that temperatures were much warmer in 1980, above freezing for most of that same period of time. So, you might erroneously conclude then, well, 2011, it's colder, no global warming. But as we demonstrated earlier, when you average over the entire year, 2011 in this example was actually two degrees warmer. July may be similarly misleading because maybe most of the days seem to have been about the same as what you remember from 1980. Maybe instead of a long cold spell like what occurred in January, maybe there's just a few unusually unseasonably warm days. For example, July 9th or July 14th, 2011 at 99 degrees. But maybe these do not stick out as much in your memory because within a day or two, you're back down to your upper 70s that, that you were used to from 1980. So July doesn't stick out in your mind as being particularly warmer, even though when we looked earlier, the average even for the month of July was warmer. And of course, the average for the year was definitely warmer. But still, looking at one region doesn't give you a complete picture. Because again, when we are talking about global warming, we are not talking about just a particular region or just a particular season or month of time. We're talking about not only averages over long periods of time, but also averages over vast regions. Global warming, global, the word global, implies over the entire globe. But even if you look, say, at an entire country, such as the United States, you may be able to discern some climate changing patterns. While you look at this map of the United States, let me draw your attention in particular to our region. Western Pennsylvania happens to exist in a place that is relatively insulated from the effects of global warming. The fact that we are not colored in with a yellow or reddish shade or a bluish shade indicates that on average, for our region, we aren't experiencing, or we did not experience, an increase in our average temperature from 1950 to 1995. However, it should be obvious from the shading in elsewhere in the United States that our region, and the Northeast in general, seems to be the exception rather than the rule. If you were to average over the entire United States, you should see a net increase in temperature from 1950 compared to 1995. I said that backwards. You should see a net increase in temperature in 1995 compared to 1950. 
And when we look over vast regions, we see other patterns. An important indicator of climate change is the Arctic sea ice shelf. As time is progressing, the shelf is becoming, the ice is becoming less and less in extent. The picture on the left is from 1979, and you see the extent of the ice in the, in the North Pole region. And if you compare that with 2007, it's dramatically smaller. My father always likes to mention that if you remember back in your days of history class, European explorers to the New World were seeking out a way to find what they called a Northwest Passage, which they thought would be a way through northern Canada to get from the northern Atlantic Ocean over to the Bering Strait and ultimately the Pacific Ocean. In their day, they eventually deduced that a Northwest Passage search was basically in vain because there was never, there was not a route that existed that was free of ice at any point during the year. But if you look at the picture in 2007, you see that this fabled Northwest Passage, which no, never existed in the past, actually could exist now. If you go along the western edge of Greenland, you see a passage through the ice, northern Canada, which leads ultimately over to near Alaska, the Bering Strait, and the Pacific Sea. This is a strong piece of evidence that our climate is changing. And if we average those temperatures over the entire globe, and not just one particular country or region, we see an increase in temperature from 1880 to 2010. Simultaneously to this increase in temperature, and here is why there is such a scientific consensus that humans are contributing to global warming, over that same period of time, the amount of carbon dioxide, remember, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, has increased dramatically. It almost looks like a straight line up if you look at the graph on the left in the present era compared to 10,000 years ago. And if you look at the blown up insert, you can see a little bit more clearly how dramatically that rise has taken place in modern times. Methane is another greenhouse gas pictured on the right, and again the increase is dramatic in our present time. The correlation between increased greenhouse gases in our atmosphere due to human activity and increased temperature over the same period of time cannot be denied. Of course, correlation does not equal causation necessarily, but scientists have many other pieces of evidence in place, such as computer modeling, that help them recreate the climate in the pa both the past and the present. These tools also point towards human contribution of global warming. If you take human activity out of these models, you do not see the temperatures that are present today. So to summarize, why do we think that humans are contributing to global warming? What are some good reasons to think about? Well, first of all, this, there is a scientific consensus. While I don't like to make arguments from authority only, scientists are experts in this matter. And there really isn't a debate amongst them, not a significant one, about the reality of humans contributing to climate change. 
The second point is that there are unprecedented levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases simultaneously with observed temperature increases. Another reason is that we know the climate has changed in the past on Earth and on other planets. Some examples might be cyanobacteria. You may not have heard of these, but these are organisms which lived on Earth about two billion years ago. Before they existed in vast numbers, the atmosphere of Earth was very poor in oxygen. If it were not for cyanobacteria, we would not be here today because cyanobacteria, just through expelling their waste gases, changed the entire composition of the atmosphere from one which was poor in oxygen to an atmosphere that is rich in oxygen, allowing us to breathe. Cyanobacteria did this merely by expelling their waste gases, in other words, breathing. If cyanobacteria could so profoundly change the climate and composition of Earth and its atmosphere, then it seems a little foolish to think that all of our modern activities pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at unprecedented rates would have no effect on the climate. Furthermore, we know that carbon dioxide in high amounts does indeed lead to the domino effect of a runaway greenhouse. This has already taken place on the planet Venus. Its atmosphere is a thick blanket of carbon dioxide, primarily composed of carbon dioxide. And its temperatures are scorching, much warmer than they should be for the position of Venus relative to the Sun. No water exists on the surface of Venus due to this runaway greenhouse effect which effectively boiled off all possible water that may have been on the surface of Venus at one point in time. Venus is utterly inhospitable to life. And this is due to an overconcentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leading to a runaway greenhouse effect. If enriched carbon dioxide could make Venus utterly inhospitable to life, despite, by the, fa by the way, the fact that Venus exists right on the cusp of what's known as the habitable zone of our solar system, then why would we think that enriching our atmosphere with carbon dioxide would not have any effect? And finally, we can appeal to logic. I've heard people claim that scientists have something to gain in perpetuating the idea of humans contributing to, to global warming. But such an idea, frankly, is a little preposterous. I am receiving no money, for example. I have nothing to gain by telling you about this. Most scientists live a very humble life. They aren't out to make money based on grants. Grants merely pay their paycheck. Nor are the people who grant grants <laughs> looking for one answer in particular. If anything, the agencies which give scientists grants might be more persuaded to hear that there is no such thing as human contribution to global warming. Because then, we could continue to live our lives the way we have. No innovation would need to be taken place and no measures or anything curbed. It would be more convenient to think this. Moreover, the scientists who are alerting us to the fact that we are contributing to gl climate change are not the same type of scientists who develop technology to help us lessen our carbon footprint. So they have no particular vested interest in a pet project. They are merely trying to uncover the truth. Besides, think about how deep the pockets are of the coal, 
and oil and gas industries. If a scientist was out to make money, a scientist could more easily look to those sort of places to gain for financial gain. It isn't easy to stand up to the powerfulness of those kind of industries. So scientists that are alerting us to climate change realities actually have the deck stacked against them. And how, even if they had something to gain, how, how could you persuade a majority of scientists to all be in on it together and nobody be a whistleblower? If anyone has something to gain, think about those, maybe in politics or industry, who rapidly deny climate change. Those are the kinds of people who may have a vested interest in continuing to drill for oil or continuing to use fossil fuels for their own financial gain. Logically, then, it doesn't make sense that scientists would perpetuate a hoax when it comes to global warming. If you can't accept the reality that global warming is taking place, here are some predictions about what might happen in the future. It's not that we will never see any cold temperatures again. If you look at the two distributions in the graph in the upper left, you see that in the new climate, cold temperatures still take place. It's just that on average, the peak of the temperatures, that is the number of times that we hit a certain temperature, it's shifted to the right towards the hotter end of the temperature spectrum. On the bottom right, you see a graph which gives a number of predictions based on how much carbon dioxide we continue to spew into the atmosphere. If we do nothing and keep everything the same rate as what it is now, then you would see the yellow line occur. And really I shouldn't say do nothing because with population increase this would mean a net cutting back of carbon footprint for each individual person. In other words, if we could keep emissions exactly the same as what they are now with today's population, the yellow curve is what you would see in the future. These are all based on computer models from NASA, by the way. The blue curve shows a slow growth in carbon dioxide. The green curve shows a moderate growth growth and the red curve a high growth. So, so even with the most conservative estimates you see a net increase over time. Let's go back to this map that we talked about earlier. If you would like there is a bonus opportunity for extra credit. We looked at this map and said if you could average over the entire country you would likely see a net increase in temperature from 19 to, in 1995 compared to 1950. To actually calculate this, you can make a very crude estimate that each region is about the same and add up the number of degrees that you see. So, so if it was blue, you would, you would add negative numbers. If it was white, you would add zero. Yellow, you would add two. Okay. And for each region, so you would add this up for, e for all the total regions in the United States and then divide by the number of regions that you see. Now this isn't a perfect estimate because if you look closely you'll notice that some regions are much, much bigger than others, but it is a crude estimate. And it'll give you a starting point for something of an average anomaly for the country as a whole. In other words, by how much, on average, 
has the temperature increased since 1950 if we compare this to 1995.